Hi, and welcome back to Black Inventors and Innovators, New Perspectives. This is our week-long webinar series that is part of our annual New Perspectives on Invention and Innovation workshop. I'm Arthur Demrich, Director of the Lemelson Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation. I wanna start by welcoming today's panel and you, the participants from across the United States and beyond. The annual New Perspectives workshop has been held by the Lemelson Center since the mid-1990s, since it was founded more or less. This is the first time we've been able to open it up to such a wide general audience. And uh, since that kind of public ed education and engagement is core to our mission, it's kind of a silver lining to the otherwise really catastrophic time that we're all living through. So I hope you're all home safe and in good condition. Um, and we're delighted to welcome you to this seminar today. If you haven't participated in a Zoom webinar previously, I have a couple of suggestions just to start. First, the upper right of your screen has a small square with some dots that says view. We recommend the speaker view while the speakers are presenting and using slides. And then after that, switching it to panel view. Um, we will do that on our back end, but you of course can control your own screen as well. Second, we welcome and encourage you to ask questions. There's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. If you click that, a window will open and then you can type in a question. Our moderator will bring those questions to the panelists um, once we get to the dialogue part of this. Um, third, there's a chat feature which kind of shares uh, any other information you have, uh, additional insights, um, citations, references, or just other comments you wanna make um, in the chat feature that's visible either just to the panelists or to everyone. Um, so we welcome you to use the chat feature, um, but for questions, please use the Q&A. We are recording this session and we'll post it online in about two weeks once we've fully captioned it. Um, the, your personal cameras are not on, so um, don't worry about you know background of your home or workplace showing, um, but you'll be able to get a recording of this down the road. Just a couple words of introduction about the Lemelson Center. We're a team housed within the National Museum of American History, one of Smithsonian's largest museums. The organization came about in 1995, thanks to the philanthropic gifts of Jerome Lemelson, an independent inventor and his family. Lemelson really had this vision of getting young people of all backgrounds to say, I too can be an inventor. And he saw inventing as a pathway to individual success as a way to raise oneself up. He saw inventing as a way to support and build communities. And he saw inventing as a pathway to American economic growth. And so we support that kind of vision to this day. And I wanna also call out and thank the Lemelson Foundation in Portland, Oregon for sponsoring this week's webinar. The Lemelson Center has a vision of a world in which everyone is inventive and contributes to innovation. We work to realize that vision through our exhibits at the museum, through other exhibits we work with uh, partner organizations on, through Spark Lab, a hands-on invention space that especially is oriented towards kids aged six to 12 and their caregivers. That's in the museum, as well as in a network of nine other museums across the US, a growing network, I should say. And more recently, we've begun to put a lot of these activities online through the Instructables and Tinkercad platforms. And we're constantly working on finding new online platforms to engage young people as well. Um, we base that kind of education and exhibit work on the research we do and on the research of collaborators, partners, and grantees. And we've had a long history of the center of focusing on less known, hidden, and even erased histories of inventors. That included a 1996 workshop, Technology and the African-American Experience, Needs and Opportunities, which resulted in several publications. This also gives an additional impetus to us to build collections and archives. And I would say, you know, part of the reason there are so many biographies of Thomas Edison isn't just that he held over a thousand patents and set up such a successful invention lab. It's because he left a massive archive. And so one of the things we aim to do is to build archives of less well-known and of minority inventors so that in the future, we really have a more balanced set of histories and perspectives on who inventors are. On Monday, we heard from the historian Ray Fouché and the economist Lisa Cook about the history of damaging myths concerning black inventors as well as their ideas for new research directions. 
including reconsidering what we even mean by an inventor. Tuesday, we heard more of a more social political analysis of gaps and reframings needed to better understand and develop the pipeline of talent through STEM uh, trainings and pathways to success for young inventors. Yesterday, two remarkable black inventors described their personal journeys to success and discussed how to inspire African-American youth, and in fact, all young people to see themselves as inventive and to act on those skills and interests. So today we're gonna to hear about and discuss commercialization, how black inventors and entrepreneurs navigate the often very difficult institutional structures associated with getting new products and new services to markets. So I'm delighted now to introduce my colleague, Crystal Moten. Dr. Moten is curator of African-American history in the Division of Work and Industry at the National Museum of American History, where she specializes in African-American business and labor history, or as her website puts it in three very powerful words, Black feminist historian. I'm pausing for applause. Her current research centers on the intersections of race, class, and gender, specifically Black women's economic activism in the civil rights era in the urban Midwest. Prior to joining the Smithsonian, Dr. Moten held academic posts at McAllister College and Dickinson College, where she, and she earned her PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Crystal. Thank you, Arthur, for that great introduction. I am so delighted to be here today, uh, especially to welcome you to session four of our Black Inventors and Innovator, uh, Innovators webinar series, where today we will focus on the topic topic of commercialization institutions from a historical and contemporary perspectives. To give you a bit more information about the grounding of the session, during the 19th century, when disenfranchised women and African Americans had limited civil, civil rights, many could still take advantage of the US patent system. Yet enslaved inventors were denied patents, while some free Black inventors purposefully concealed their identities to avoid prejudice at the patent office and in the marketplace. To commercialize their, uh, their inventions, today's Black inventors and entrepreneurs engage with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, uh, university tech transfer offices, venture capitalists, digital and brick and mortar sales channels, and sometimes defend their intellectual property in court. In this session, our featured speakers will consider how these institutions have treated Black inventors, Black entrepreneurs access to networks of capital and expertise, and reforms needed to improve commercialization rates among Black inventors. The format of our session will be that each speaker will speak for 20 minutes, after which I will facilitate a discussion between the two speakers and myself, which will allow us to put together the ideas that were um, discussed in both presentations. After the discussion, we will have time for questions and answers, which we will receive through the question and answer feature of the Zoom platform. I will briefly introduce each speaker before they speak, starting with our first speaker, Cara Swanson. Cara W. Swanson is professor of law and affiliate professor of history at Northeastern University in Boston. Her scholarship focuses on the historical intersections among law, science, medicine, and technology, concentrating on the United States patent system, the regulation of reproduction and the body, and issues of race, gender, and sexuality. Her first book, Banking on the Body, the Market in Blood, Milk, and Sperm in Modern America was published by Harvard University Press in 2014 and is a history of property in the human body as understood through the 20th century history of bankable body products. Dr. Swanson's book in progress is tentatively titled Inventing Citizens, Race, Gender, and Patents. So uh, Dr. Swanson, take it away. Thank you very much, Dr. Moten. All right, and thank you very much also to the Lemelson Center and the organizers of this terrific set of conversations. We've really had a series of great discussions this week about 
Black inventors and innovators. And today, as Dr. Moten says, we're turning our attention to commercialization and institutions. And I want to start off by focusing our attention on the patent system itself, an institution formed by laws and those who carry out the law designed to promote the commercialization of innovation. The United States patent system is quite old. It began in 1790. And by the mid 19th century, the United States had built this grand patent office building, which I'm showing on this slide here. It covers an entire block in DC and it housed the people who processed patent applications and also the thousands of model inventions that Americans submitted as part of their patent applications. Some of you may know if you're in DC that the building today houses the National Portrait Gallery and the American Art Museum. The patent office is no longer there. Today, I want to take us inside the patent office to describe how the patent system has worked throughout US history to hide black invention and innovation. And then flip our perspective to consider how the patent system has also worked to reveal black invention. And more importantly, how black civil rights activists use the patent system not only to reveal black invention, but also to bolster their claims for political, legal and social equality. These activists teach us the stakes of recognizing and promoting Black invention and innovation, stakes that add urgency to the work that Shantavia Johnson and others are doing to support Black entrepreneurs and improve the rate of innovation and the rate of successful commercialization in the Black community in the United States. So here, this is a picture of the display room in that old patent office building where <laughs> row upon row of glass cases displayed American inventions. If you walk through this room, when it was used as a gallery this way, you would have had the impression that all US inventors were white. And there are three overlapping and reinforcing reasons for this. The first is just outright theft. The patent records in this office hide black invention. Enslavers use the patent system to claim ownership of the inventions of enslaved people of African descent using patents to take the fruit of their minds as their rightful property, as well as taking the sweat of their brow, that is their labor, and as you know, taking their reproductive capacity by claiming ownership of their children. The patent system thus was used during slavery as part of an overall system of laws that attempted to commodify some humans in every way possible and extract value from them to benefit white Americans. There's just no question that as soon as Africans arrived in North America, they began contributing to the technology of first the colonies and later the United States. As the people using tools and laboring in all sorts of capacities, they innovated and improved. But forbidden from learning to read and write, lacking legal capacity under the law, it was simply not possible for enslaved people to seek patents for such innovations or usually to leave any trace at all of what they had done. We do have, however, some evidence of early contributions from free black persons, such as these men. James Fortin here on the left used his inventiveness to support his very successful sale loft business in Philadelphia. He was quite successful, although there's no record that he received a patent for his invention. Thomas Jennings here on the right, not only invented a new means of dry cleaning, but successfully obtained a patent for it in 1821 which is the earliest known patent granted to a Black inventor by the United States. What we don't know is how many Black inventors had their inventions stolen by white enslavers who sought a patent falsely claiming to be an inventor. The patent law forbids such applications, lying under oath that you are the inventor when you're not. But who would be able to detect that the white applicant swearing that oath was lying when the um, person who knew best was in the total control of the person seeking the patent. It is ironic that we actually know how eager enslavers were to use the patent system to wring more value from their human property from a few failed applications by white enslavers who tried to persuade the patent office that they shouldn't have to hide their theft. The law of slavery, they argued, granted them the right to seek a patent as an owner of a black inventor. Mississippi plantation owner Joseph Davis tried to get his brother, then Senator Jefferson Davis, to help him patent an invention by this man, Benjamin Montgomery, a black inventor Davis owned under the system of slavery. 
not even Jeff Davis, whose name may be familiar to you as the future president of the Confederacy, though, was successful in persuading the patent office to take this last step in changing the law to aid the theft of Black invention. Also in the 1850s, Oscar Stewart, who was a Mississippi lawyer, as well as an enslaver, pushed the point so hard at the patent office that finally the Secretary of Interior, who was the boss of the patent commissioner, asked the Attorney General to rule on this issue. Can an enslaver get a patent to an invention by an enslaved person? And the Attorney General said flatly, in these words that you saw earlier this week in Dr. Fouché's presentation, a machine invented by a slave cannot be patented. This slight impediment to enslavers did not, however, keep men like Oscar Stewart and Joseph Davis from taking Black inventions and seeking to profit from them. Oscar might have failed to patent the new plow invented by an enslaved blacksmith named Ned, but he advertised it for sale as the Stewart plow. So this is the first way Black invention was hidden by the patent system. White enslavers patenting the inventions of the enslaved lying about the source of the invention, and then layered on top of that, an interpretation of the patent law, which flatly excluded all enslaved inventors from the patent system. Indeed, this attorney general opinion went on to say that because of the recent Dred Scott Supreme Court decision in 1857, holding that Americans of African descent, whether free or enslaved, had no legal rights, that free inventors like Fortin and Jennings were also legally unable to get patents, although free inventors, as I just told you, had been getting patents. The second way that Black invention was hidden by the patent system was also the result of anti-Black racism, and um, Dr. Morton referred to this in her introduction. Free Black inventors, both before and after the Civil War, even decades after slavery was outlawed and after the legal bar to Black patents was removed, sometimes chose to make arrangements to have their inventions patented by a white man because they believed, with good reason, that white businessmen and white consumers would be more likely to invest in and buy a product if they thought it was created by a white person rather than a black person. In other words, in order to maximize their chances of commercial success and profit from their invention, some black inventors chose to hide their role. One example of this is Henry Boyd, a black carpenter who had uh, earned money and bought himself out of slavery and settled in the free state of Ohio in the 1830s. He took this approach with a bedstead that he um, invented. He patented it through a white man named George Porter, although he went into business himself selling the bedstead. Half a century later in 1891, black inventor Ellen Eglin told um, another woman that she sold her improved ringer for only $18 to a white investor who reportedly patented themselves and successfully commercialized it because if it was known that a Negro woman patented the invention, white ladies would not buy the ringer. The final reason is not as nefarious, but is equally insidious and that is just straight up invisibility. When black inventors did receive patents and more and more did with each decade after slavery, the records of the patent office were and are silent as to the racial identity of the named inventors, allowing Americans to continue to walk these halls and see only white invention and believe that black inventors simply didn't and don't exist. This invisibility, of course, exacerbated by the theft from some and the decisions of others to use a white patentee to increase the chances of successful commercialization. This invisibility continues to feed the experience of Black inventors in the workplace that Dr. Ty Grandison described yesterday, in which their contributions are devalued and dismissed based on assumptions of inability. And this third way in which the patent system has hidden Black invention is tied to the way in which the patent system has also been used to reveal Black invention and leads me to Black inventors and civil rights movements. Now I'm using civil rights movements here broadly to refer not just to the post-World War II fight against Jim Crow, but to multiple overlapping movements by generations of activists from the pre-Civil War to the present. The reason that I can sit here today and tell you a little bit about Thomas Jennings is that earlier activists made a concerted effort to identify Black patentees and then to publicize Black inventors and patents granted to Black inventors, both individually and collectively as part of the push for legal, 
social and economic equality for Black Americans. What do I mean by that? Well, this picture here on the slide is from the Paris Exposition of 1900, which is one of the grand world's fairs that occurred in the US and around the world beginning in the mid 1980s and, or 1850s, sorry, and continuing into the 20th century. It is a small, crowded, but prize-winning Afro-American exhibit within the United States section at that fair. And it was curated by Black Americans, W.E.B. Du Bois and Thomas Calloway. And they were trying to show, according to Du Bois, the history and present condition of Black Americans. And in addition to 500 photographs and 200 books written by Black Americans, they managed to squeeze in a copy of each known patent granted to a Black inventor. More than 400 of them are somewhere in this exhibit. I keep thinking they're somewhere in these uh, wall um, portfolios here. This record of 400 Black inventors whose inventions had been patented was largely created by Henry Baker, a Black lawyer and patent office employee who spent decades trying to match memories to patent office records to identify as many Black patentees as he could. In 1913, the new Black Civil Rights Organization, the NAACP, where Du Bois was now in charge of publications, published a pamphlet with Baker's List and an essay about Black inventors throughout US history. There's just simply no question that today all Black patentees have not been identified and that we will never know exactly how many Black inventors are hidden in patent office records. But without Baker's efforts, we would know a lot less. And that brings me to the stakes of making Black invention visible, both then and now. Stakes that are directly related to questions of commercialization and to the racial equality that Du Bois and so many others spent their lives working towards. To understand these stakes, we need to ask ourselves why? Why did Baker spend decades trying to identify Black patentees? Why did leaders of Black civil rights movements publicize Baker's work, not just in Paris and via the NAACP pamphlet, but at many US-based world's fairs as well, and in the media? Why did generations of activists who followed Baker, whose stories I don't have time to tell you right now, continue his project of identifying and publicizing Black patentees? Patents, as inventors like Boyd and enslavers like Davis and Baker as a patent office employee knew, are instruments of commercialization of an invention. They are legal rights that give the patent owner a period of time to be the only one making and selling their invention, a means of profiting from it. And as Du Bois appreciated, Black Americans needed and wanted to participate in every way in developing businesses and earning money. Access to the patent system is one step among the many that lead from innovation to profit. But the patent system was also doing something else when it granted a Black inventor a patent. It was certifying through the government that the inventor had come up with something new and useful. For activists who were fighting anti-Black racism, including the argument of scientific racism that people of African descent constituted a distinct race that was inferior and biologically limited in mental capacity, Patents thus were a powerful form of rebuttal evidence and a form that kept increasing in quantity year after year as more black inventors did get patents. Particularly as white Americans frequently inserted that black Americans could not originate, but only imitate. And not only that, but white Americans directly linked the assertion that blacks could not invent to their justifications for legalized white supremacy. In 1913, in his pamphlet, Baker described how a Maryland politician running for election in the first years of the 20th century included in his stump speech the assertion that, quote, the colored race should be denied the right to vote because no one of the race had ever yet reached the dignity of an inventor, which, of course, was untrue and could be disproven with patent office records. But this assertion that African Americans could not invent and therefore did not deserve the right to vote needs to be um, examined. This might seem like an odd claim today, but in the early Republic, white Americans had come to see themselves as a uniquely inventive people, and also to understand that quality, inventiveness, as directly related to participating in democratic self-government in the form of voting. Since the American Revolution, American elites had believed citizens who participated in democratic governance required the capacity to think independently. And as white men excluded others from the polls and other citizenship 
duties like jury service, they justified that exclusion on the basis of the assertion that these others, black men and women, white women, were incapable of independent thought. They, like children and the insane, might be citizens, but they could not be voters. This understanding of the role of inventiveness and its relationship to voting made patents useful political tools to fight against Jim Crow voting restrictions and in the broader battle for full citizenship rights. As proof that each patentee had originated something and not just imitated, they were government certification of the capacity for independent thought that Americans thought full citizenship required. So in this context, Black inventiveness was relevant to calls for equality and counting up and publicizing how many Black Americans had received patents was a sound political strategy, hence the NAACP publicizing Black patentees. Before I turn things over to my co-panelist, Shantavia Johnson, I want to argue that this dual role of patents, that is, as a means of commercialization and accumulation of economic resources, that is, resources that Black inventors can accumulate through the patent system and which also can be taken from the Black community via the patent system when their ideas are taken. And Dr. Tahira Reed Smith testified as to that still happening um, yesterday. That's one role, but also as evidence of the ability to participate as a full equal in the civic sphere, that this dual role remains in the present, which raises the stakes on promoting and recognizing Black invention and innovation and commercialization via the patent system today. We here in the United States still like to think of ourselves as a uniquely inventive hall of people, or a uniquely inventive people. We have this National Inventors Hall of Fame. And while we don't tie the ability to invent overtly to the right to vote, it does remain tied to our concept of the ideal American and the ideal citizen. It's for this reason, I think, that our government runs programs to, quote, shape the future of American ingenuity by encouraging the inventiveness of American children through these programs run by the patent office. Yes, we do this because we want more innovation, but I think we're as we laud inventors as heroes, and we encourage children to think of themselves as inventors, we are also training children in a particular view of who an American is. And since 2016, immigration has returned forcefully to our national agenda. There's also been a discussion about measuring immigrant contributions to the United States by counting patents given to immigrants, which reminds me so forcefully of these early Black civil rights activists who used the patent system to argue for inclusion in full citizenship. So thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to hearing more about the present from Shantave Johnson and to um, your questions and comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Swanson. I am really looking forward to discussing uh, the points you made in your presentation. Uh, for now, I would like to introduce Shantavia Johnson, who is Associate Vice President for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Clemson University. Uh, Shantavia Johnson, JD, thrives at the intersection of law, entrepreneurship, and culture. Twice named one of the top lawyers in America, Ms. Johnson serves as Associate Vice President for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Clemson University. She has also founded LVRG, a company giving women of color an entrepreneurship formula that allows them to make an impact in income by leveraging intellectual part property. Johnson has spoken on several stages, including TEDx, South by Southwest, and Google, and has appeared in Time, The Washington Post, The Los Angeles Times, and on NPR, and the podcast, Here to Slay. She is a widely published writer who also loves extreme sports and traveling. Really excited to hear um, from, from you, um, uh, Associate Vice President Johnson. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Crystal, for that introduction. Thank you to the Wendelson Center for this opportunity. And finally, thank you to my co-panelist, Kira Swanson, who I met for the first time when I was entering the academy and whose scholarship really has inspired me since then. So I'm going to share my screen with you for my slides. And I put in the chat 
an opportunity for you to participate along with me with uh, the presentation and with some of my questions. And to do so, use the information in the chat. You have to visit menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and enter the code that I have placed in the chat. And then finally, uh, I, I will say that you know, I'm here. I'm Shanta Lee Johnson from Clemson University. Is anybody here from Notre Dame? Please resist the urge to gloat. <laughs> but I'm really quite excited to be here. And before I get started, what I want to remind everybody or tell you for the first time is that today is also Women's Entrepreneurship Day, which provides an opportunity for us to celebrate women entrepreneurs and also to expose their challenges. So today I dedicate these remarks specifically to Black women innovators and inventors, some of whom names we know, some of whom we don't. And before I get started, what I'd like to do is really begin with a story. So the most prolific Black inventor I've ever known was my grandmother, Jamie Williams Jackson. This is her in the top right or in the right side of the picture. And she was born, raised, and died in rural South Carolina, born in 1921. And she was the oldest of 19 brothers and sisters. She had to drop out of school in the second grade to take care of her siblings. And she had 12 children of her own. And she was the most innovative person I've ever known, right? And one of her most, one of her greatest inventions was a teething necklace that she invented and I come from a huge family. She had 12 children. She had 19 brothers and sisters. So I have a huge family. And when we were teething as babies, she would, and she would create these little necklaces that were a combination of mechanical and agricultural innovation. And it would immediately soothe teething pain. And she would make these devices not just for us, as I presume she did for her own children, but for other people in the community. She was focused on solving a community-based problem. Is my audio going in and out? Sorry, everybody. Is it better now? So I can also, let's see if the audio is better. If I, uh, let's see, the audio may be better if I use a different mode. Let's try this. Is this better at all? Was this better at all for everybody? Okay, great. So I blame my AirPods. <laughs> I was using them to drown out the background noise. But I will just recount really quickly. The most prolific innovator and inventor I ever knew was my grandmother, Janie Williams, who's in the right side of this picture. And one of the things that she invented was a teething necklace. She had to drop out of school in second grade to help take care of her 19 brothers and sisters, but she was a prolific inventor. And this teething necklace that she invented would immediately soothe teething pain. It was a combination of mechanical innovation and agricultural innovation. And as I understand it, the thought never crossed her mind to commercialize this, this invention at all. She was constantly inventing things, but she never thought to sell it. She always thought to solve the community-based problem. And she didn't need the incentive of commercialization because she was solving for community-based necessity. And this reminds me of the Khoisan people of South Africa who were thought by some to be the first people on the planet. And they too were innovators. They had an encyclopedic knowledge of agricultural biology and they were constantly innovating for millennia before patent law, before incentive-based structures, before innovation. The Khoisan were developing new technology long before we got here. And like my grandmother, they weren't doing so with the goal of commercializing and selling that innovation to other tribes of people who they were competing with when they were hunting and gathering, but for community survival. So I wanna start by saying that while we are here today to analyze and deconstruct the concept of patent commercialization with the ultimate goal of black innovators participating in the innovation ecosystem, perhaps we should frame the conversation a little differently Kara presented this topic or teed it up for me perfectly because perhaps the problem 
is not the disconnect between black innovators in modern times, perhaps the problem is our system and the cultural norms that can play a role in shaping what our standards should be, right? So the, the first statutory patent system is about 550 years old, based in Italy. The American system is half as young. It is a pretty young model of innovation. And it's based on the premise, to Professor Swanson's point, based on the premise that a patent is a temporary way to obstruct competition, to charge more in the marketplace, to incentivize inventors. But the oldest communities on the planet, like the Khoisan, have existed on this planet for more than 250,000 years. It might be that we have it backwards, that we need to retool our system, not the other way around. And one of the first statements in the promotional materials for the event today state something along the lines of the events of 2020 have drawn renewed attention to long-standing inequity in our innovation ecosystem and also that black americans have a complex relationship with technology and i would like to just propose that maybe it isn't black americans that have a complex relationship with technology maybe it's that the system is flawed as Professor Swanson mentioned, we've created this innovation ecosystem and this patent system that looks at ideal citizenry in a certain way. But perhaps the longest standing inequality in our ecosystem is that patent law, which has been more or less silent on the issue of race, is inherently built on a model that presumes one kind of innovation is desirable, that is tied to personal commercial benefit, while another kind of innovation, the kind that is rooted in community survival and societal need, is uncivilized, is primitive, and unworthy of patent protection. So I raise that first to just say the way that we think about incentivizing innovation may need a bit of reframing. But that aside, considering that commercialization maybe isn't the goal. Uh, I live in South Carolina. I'm at Clemson University, as Crystal pointed out, that one pointed out. And our Department of Commerce has defined innovation as the, uh, here we go to the next slide, as, as the relentless pursuit of transformational ideas, right? This is a, a crowdsource definition. I think it's a pretty good shot at the definition of innovation. The Limelson Center has also defined innovation in its strategic plan. And the way the Limelson Center defines innovation aligns with this concept of the transformational ideas and the relentless pursuit of these transformational ideas. But the Limelson Center definition states that innovation is an answer to an important customer or societal need. But no matter how you define innovation, whether it's being in the relentless pursuit of transformational ideas or scaling up an invention or answering important needs, customer or societal needs, innovation in America is expensive, hence the need for commercialization in our modern ecosystem. So that's the theme of the day for me, that innovation really is expensive. It's hard to be relentless when you don't have disposable income to hire the people you need to hire, like patent lawyers. Scaling up is impossible if you don't have access to venture capital or some other form of funding. So the relentless pursuit of transformational ideas, developing inventions that create value, absolutely need commercialization. And when we exclude people from that commercialization, we exclude some of the best ideas. We can't have transformational ideas if there are monolithic solutions to these problems. Those aren't really solutions if they are monolithic. So creating value really does exist in a vacuum unless you define who value is being granted to and what the value they see in that innovation is. And we can't have transformational ideas without having everyone Get, or without giving everyone an equal opportunity to participate. So I view this as the real challenge with commercialization. In our existing ecosystem, we absolutely need more inventors with diverse backgrounds who can obtain patents and commercialize them. 
It's not charity work. It's not just because this is some way to right a historical wrong or a present wrong. It's also because it's better for the bottom line. There are better solutions. There are more values provided to people in a diverse society who can in turn become more productive members of society because they have the added benefit of that innovation. So if innovation is expensive, what solution should we prioritize? So this is the first question I have for you all today. And the question is, what should we prioritize? So again, you can go to menti.com and use the code that exists here, or you can use the link that I posted in the chat or that others have posted in the chat. And you've got to pick one. So I'll give you all a couple of minutes. Thank you, Laura, for sharing the link again. What should we prioritize? Should we prioritize making innovation less expensive or do we just throw money at the problem? And as you are voting, I wanna just offer you a couple of data points and a couple of ideas around something Crystal mentioned earlier. When we are talking about commercialization, we're really talking about two different things, two different phases of commercialization. There's creating and protecting intellectual property and then managing, exploiting and policing that intellectual property. And these are expensive things. So I'll give you all another minute or so to vote. It looks like we've got about 30 or so votes. And hopefully you can still hear me okay. If you can't, please let me know in the chat. I blame my AirPods for that, my apologies. But it looks like we've got a good number of responses here. So let's just see here. So about, let's see, 30 of you or so say make innovation less expensive. Uh, 17 or so of you say we should prioritize giving people more money. And this is a hard question, I think. I don't think there's a, a right answer. Thank you very much for letting me know in the chat that you can hear me. I don't know that there's a right answer to this. I have my own thoughts. I wonder if you'll change your mind by the end of my remarks here. But what should we prioritize? It looks like a lot of you say making innovation less expensive. So what I'd like to do is share what we mean by commercialization. So this whole discussion is about commercializing intellectual, pro intellectual property. And again, there are really two phases of this. The first phase is to invent and protect. The second phase is to manage, exploit, and police. So what I'd like to do is talk about all the iterative steps that have to happen for commercialization and why there are so many institutional barriers for Black inventors and innovators. So first, in terms of inventing and protecting, if you are an individual inventor, you can go at it alone, you can apply for a patent on your own, do it as a solo inventor. And I've got one another question for you about this. So as you're thinking about inventors and innovators in the US, oftentimes we think of like the solo inventor in a garage. So if you are just an individual inventor, I, my question for you is, let's see. Uh, sorry, let me go back. Hopefully you can see the question. If you can't see the question, please let me know. But the question that I've asked here is what is the average cost to obtain a patent? What is the average cost to obtain a patent? If you can vote here, what is the average cost to obtain a patent? Is it $10,000? Is it $25,000, $60,000, $100,000? And most of you say around $25,000. The actual average cost from start to finish to receive a patent in the United States is just about $60,000. And let me show you what that breakdown looks like. So the, a law firm created this chart, Blue Iron LLC, or a, a consulting firm, and they took this data from the AIPLA's annual study, USPTO data, and some other things. And from start to finish, not just the filing of the application, but from 
filing the application to prosecution to maintenance and everything else on average. And, and the, the really interesting thing about this figure for those of you who are patent lawyers or connected to the patent system is that this is for small entities, not large entities. The average cost to receive a patent from start to finish and maintain it is about $60,000 for a small entity. For a large entity, it's about double that. So about $120,000 or so. And so we're starting about, we're talking about starting with a very difficult hurdle to cross getting that patent application, getting the first 10 or $15,000 to get that patent application filed is literally just step one. And if you are in phase one of creating and protecting your IP, you have to figure out where this money is going to come from so that you can participate effectively in the commercialization process. The next thing in phase one that we can really kind of think about. So say you're not a solo inventor, but you're a person who works for a company, right? Who has some type of research and development uh, arm that allows employees to innovate and invent things. And the company takes on the cost of whatever that, that invention costs. There's, there's some really interesting data around how much industries spend per invention Per, for based on manufacturing sectors, just how much it costs for R&D, right? And so if we're talking about as a solo inventor, really having to come up with about $60,000. If you are in a company that has an R&D budget, look at this expenditure, right? So the, the cheapest R&D budgets are spending about $5,000 per employee on innovation on creating new and different technologies. When you go all the way up to pharmaceuticals and medicines, which are very, very expensive innovations to patent, spending $165,000 per employee. So if we think about Black inventors and Black innovators, first of all, you've got to have the degree. You have to have the background and the education, which is a whole nother conversation. And when we think about uh, student loans and access to education and all those things, which we'll get into in the q and A, I I know, but it's really, really expensive, even if you are in a company that has an R&D division or has some form of R&D budget. And if you are the owner of a company yourself and you are uh, a, an African American, you've got to have a pretty huge budget to get in the game, to get in the innovation game. So that is another way that when we think about commercialization can be a barrier to inventors, whether you're going at it alone, whether you're in a, a private company or a public company. And what about if you're in a university? So I know there are a lot of academics here. Uh, there are around 350 or so tech transfer offices in the United States. The Association of University Technology Managers has members in its organization, and this organization is really the leading organization supporting commercialization of academic research, uh, has members from about 350 different universities, research institutions, and teaching hospitals. So if you are a Black innovator or inventor in a university, what does commercialization look like for you? So again, first, you have to be at one of these institutions. Uh, you have to get the PhD. You have to overcome significant structural and institutional barriers there too. Uh, and also, while the financial gains of patents are significant for universities, the rewards are usually only reaped by a few universities. And there's some data that I pulled from this organization called The Plug that compares patent rates from historically white institutions and historically black colleges and universities. And just a few years ago in 2017, the University of California got 524 patents. They were in first place for receiving patents among other universities. Second place was MIT with 306 patents, University of Texas with 219. While I know this, this chart is a little hard to read, what the chart shows is that between 1969 and 2012, 
HBCUs have only been granted a total of 101 patents, and more than half of those were awarded between 2010 and 2012. And most of those went to Howard University, Florida, A&M University, and uh, Morehouse School of Medicine. And those three who are in the top three of HBCUs received 18, 17, and 16 patents, respectfully. And so we even see these gaps in the university infrastructure. Crystal did an amazing job at the beginning of this conversation outlining what commercialization looks like and who Black inventors and innovators have to engage with. And what I am hoping to show through this presentation is that at every stage, it is incredibly challenging to find places where there's equity in any stage of commercialization. It is it is almost mind blowing. It, it's sad and mind blowing with the gaps that exist in commercialization at every step, right? So if we're thinking about commercialization, first you actually have to invent the thing and you've got to apply for the thing, right? And what exists somewhere between there, especially for solo inventors, which make up a large the segment of, of individual inventors, the, the, the one person, not necessarily a person in a company with huge R&D or in a university, you've got to pay for it. And I see some remarks in the chat about who's paying for these things, where the funding comes from, and all of that. And one of the interim considerations here is really how people pay for this in a system where the average patent cost $60,000 in a system where companies are spending upwards of $150,000 per employee on R&D and where HBCUs together don't have as many patents as one of the top three uh, predominantly white institutions, where can funding come from? So excellent questions and comments in the chat there. Uh, venture capital is a primary source of bridging that gap. And the gaps in venture capital funding, and if there are any VCs here, would love to dialogue with you about this. The gaps in VC funding are almost unexplainable, or, or they really are unexplainable. And so I have another question here for you. Again, go to menti.com and use the code. Here's the second question. And the second question revolves around who actually gets funding. And I've created a timer so I don't spend too much time on these because I can go on and on. But how much venture capital funding goes to Black founders? Take a guess. How much venture capital funding goes to Black founders, also included in that Black founders, Black inventors, Black innovators? How much venture capital funding? So let's see what our results here. Most of you say 1% and most of you are right. Just 1% of venture backed founders are Black. And even drilling down into this a little bit more, again, today is Women's Entrepreneurship Day, female founders receive about 2.8% of VC funding. So when we're looking at where the money is going, it's going to predominantly white male founded companies, right? And so that provides yet another barrier. There's so many components within this commercialization uh, uh, equation. So another question related to VC funding, and so get ready because I'm gonna start the countdown pretty quickly, is how many black women receive VC funding? How much venture capital funding goes to black women founders? So take a gander, 1% of venture backed founders are black, female founders receive about 3%, 2.8% of VC funding. How much VC funding goes to black women founders? And let's see what your guess is here. Most of you say 0% and most of you are right. Black women founders, particularly some of the most recent data is between 2009 and 2017, received 0.0006% of all venture capital raised between 2019 and 2017. And that is despite providing a higher return on investment than other groups by any way that you measure it. And so when we talk about where the money comes from to pay for these things so that we can, can even get to commercialization, it's difficult. The numbers are very, very difficult. You're exactly right, whoever said that in the chat. We have miles to go. So the other place 
where commercialization uh, becomes a, a stopgap where there's a, a, a stopping place for Black inventors and, and innovators is with starting businesses, right? So you have to put all the pieces together. Once you get the intellectual property, what do you actually do with it? And according to the SBA, most micro businesses, so single member LLCs or uh, very, very small businesses cost around $3,000 to start. If we're talking about just across the board, average starting cost to start a new business, according to the Kauffman Foundation, is about $30,000. And so when we talk about commercialization, I think oftentimes we like to hover around how much it costs to get a patent. But what I'd like to illustrate here is that there are costs along the way that can create real significant barriers for Black inventors and Black innovators. So $3,000 for a micro business, $30,000 for uh, a, a, any average new business, that can be a challenge. And someone says university tech transfer offices can cover some of these fees. Yes, that is exactly right. Or if you're in a, a private company and the private company has R&D, they cover some of those things. So then the, the, the cost barrier drills down further into access to educational opportunities and resources and uh, pay and equity and all those things. But I don't wanna get too sidetracked there are these barriers at every stage. So once you've started the business, you've spent 3,000, 30,000, somewhere in between. One of the last places Crystal mentioned, I'm gonna wrap up because I know I'm running out of time, is defending IP in court. And one of the really interesting places where commercialization becomes a challenge is with patent litigation. Because for all of you here who are familiar with the patent system or have some passing familiarity with the patent system, you probably appreciate that a patent is only as good as what you're willing to do with it, right? What you get when you get a patent is not an affirmative right to do anything. What you get is a right to exclude to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering for sale, importing your invention into the United States. So what a patent gives you is the right to go out and stop other people. So how much does it cost to go out and stop other people? And this is where the numbers become increasingly difficult. The average cost of patent litigation in the US last year according to the AIPLA, the Association of Intellectual Property Law, or the American Association of Intellectual Property Law, cost between $700,000 and $4 million. That's the median. There's a lot of derivation within there, right? But to actually defend your IP, to police your IP, to, to defend your IP in court, your patent in court, cost between $700,000 and $4 million. And that, prevent, that causes another barrier, another, difficult, another difficulty for inventors and innovators. And then finally, implicit in all of this, and I saw a question about this in the chat, I think, about intellectual property lawyers. It's finding and working with an intellectual property lawyer. Implicit in all of these steps for commercialization is that the inventor probably needs to engage with legal counsel and more specifically with a patent lawyer. And the American economy really has grown leaps and bounds in this space uh, as it relates to innovation and technology. Kara mentioned during her remarks that you know, we really have fashioned ourselves as one of the most innovative countries on the planet. We've branded ourselves that way. And so the need for intellectual property lawyers has followed suit. Even though there are only about 35,000 registered patent lawyers in the United States, intellectual property accounts for about 20% of all job openings. And there are about 1.3 million licensed lawyers in America. So 35,000 lawyers out of 1.3 million licensed lawyers and 20% of the jobs are intellectual property jobs. So that means it is not difficult if you are in this space, the IP space probably, to find professional work. But the challenge is that there is very little representation in the field. So the final quiz question, and I'll wrap up after this, is how many registered patent attorneys are there in the United States? 
what percentage of all licensed attorneys in the country, all licensed IP lawyers in the country, what percentage are Black? What percentage of IP lawyers are Black? You've got about 10 seconds. Again, I don't want to spend too much time on these questions, but I do want to give you an opportunity to answer them. And let's see here. Most of you say 1%. So around 3% of IP lawyers are African American in this country. And, and that means if I am a black inventor and I'm looking for someone who understands culturally the challenges that might exist for me as a black innovator or inventor, about 3% of the lawyers out there are black. And that's not to say I have to have a black intellectual property lawyer, but do realize as an inventor or an innovator who is uh, African-American, there are so many things that we just never have really had to experience before. There's so many things we, we have not been exposed to as it relates to intellectual property. I didn't know what intellectual property was until I went to law school at all. Just this week, I had a young African-American scientist reach out to me. He's a, an undergraduate he got his undergraduate degree at Howard, got his PhD from a very prestigious university. He's listed as a co-inventor on a patent that produces licensing royalties. And he had been working with a white lawyer who he said felt like talked down to him, didn't really understand uh, some of the things he was trying to ask about. And he didn't really know how to engage with this person. And he heard me on the radio. He heard me on the, the Karen Hunter show. And um, he reached out to me because he heard me on the radio and he said he could not find a black lawyer to talk to him about patent law in a way that he could understand. And that is just one anecdotal story. But the point is, is that oftentimes, even if we have good ideas as black inventors and innovators, it may be difficult to bridge the cultural gap of getting the legal assistance that we need. And so really quickly, just the final thing I want to suggest, I know, you know, there are 100 or 200 or so of you here. What can you do? And just in the last minute, I would like to give some one suggestion for what you can do. So in a former life, my research revolved around internet memes. I have a, a TEDx talk that's all about internet memes and their impact on society. So I'm going to use a meme here. This is one of my favorite memes. I, I blocked out the profanity in the meme. But the meme basically suggests that you pick a struggle, right? And what we mean by picking a struggle, and again, I'm going to cite a, a very non site a very unscientific source, Urban Dictionary. Picking a struggle essentially means decide what challenge you want to focus your effort and your energy on. We will not solve all of these problems separately or by ourselves. It will take so many different people working on all of the different buckets, all of the different arms of commercialization to ensure that Black inventors and Black innovators achieve parity, achieve some form of equity in America's innovation ecosystem. So if you have questions or comments, I would love to talk about them with you. Please reach out to me. My information is below. You can find me on social at the link below at Shantavia J E S Q or my website at Shantavia.com. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shantavia, for your um, for your presentation. Um, so enriching and so many uh, things to think about and, and to consider. Um, I would now like to invite uh, Kara to uh, join us um, again so that I can facilitate a, a short conversation between the three of us, um, but really uh, bringing together and thinking about some of the main points that each of you uh, brought up in your talk and uh, points that kind of sparked some ideas um, within me. And so one of the first um, kind of things that I am thinking about, and what I'll do is I'll just um, kind of share a couple of questions um, and then you two can uh, uh, think about uh, answers um, and we can do it that way. And then I'll open it up for the audience to put questions in the Q&A. Um, but Cara, in your presentation, um, you made connections between um, asking us to think about innovation as practice, but also kind of an innovator as identity and how both of those can be connected to citizenship. Um, and I was really struck by um, the 1913 
quote that you shared um, with us from, let me just look at my notes, excuse me, Henry Baker, I believe, kind of sharing how um, being able to pursue innovation, being able to, um, to engage in the practice of invention could equal citizenship. And so my question um, um, is asking you to kind of think or to provide a little bit more insight of how you've seen kind of the connections between innovation and citizenship, how that's changed over time, um, especially as we think about African-American inventors and how um, and what, what we think about citizenship. So really thinking about the connections between innovation and citizenship and your thoughts on how that has uh, changed over time, especially since since 1913. And for you, Shantavia, I was really curious um, in thinking about a point you raised at the very top of your presentation where you kind of just uh, said that we should rethink um, the system or how we incentivize innovation. And you made that point in connection to thinking about uh, African cultures and how communal practices um, are prioritized and valued. And so I wanted to kind of have us think through what would it look like to rethink how we incentivize um, innovation and how we think about the role of the community um, in participating in that in incentivization. And then for both of you, I am really interested in uh, following up on points related to gender, um, especially thinking about the role of women in invention, the role of women um, in um, um, garnering um, and gathering funds um, and really kind of think through what are some of the challenges and opportunities uh, that women face um, both historically and this, in this contemporary moment to kind of uh, think about the intersectional kind of connections between all of these. And so those are some of the questions that I wanted to lead with and you can feel free to pick up bits and pieces of that um, as, um, as you choose. And I'll kind of also be collating the questions in the Q and A, so. Um, whoever would like to kind of jump in. Okay, well, Cara, I, I do not want to jump in if there are some things that you wanted to say. First, um, yes, I'm happy to um, to answer those questions, uh, Dr. Moten, and I particularly appreciate the two you gave me because they're, they're related. You asked me about um, since 1913 this idea that um, inventiveness, as certified through the patent system, has some political meaning as well as its economic meaning, and as a historian. As you well know, we look for changes over time and we look for what stays the same over time. And what is um, really striking to me from this research that I've been working on is that this is not changing over time. So I, I skipped points. I showed you 1913 and I showed you 2016 with some uh, research about people counting patents granted to immigrants as a way of discussing who we should let in to become citizens. That's the immigration fight is who gets to be a citizen. Um, but in between those data points, there are generations of people who were doing exactly what Henry Baker was doing. So somebody asked in the chat about Patricia Carter Slubby, and she's definitely one of my heroines. She's also a Black scientist and patent office employee who has spent decades continuing his work, trying to identify through people's memories, because there's nothing in the patent office record, what black patentees there are in the patent office and what female patentees are in the patent office. Those are a little easier to guess based on first names, but there's also not a, but you can't just push a button and say, how many patents did women get this year? Um, and I, um, in the essay that was in the chat where I talk about this, she's one of the people I lift up as an inheritor of Baker. And there are others from generations earlier, all of whom have connections to the idea that I'm doing this I am publicizing and counting these patents um, as a means of, yes, of restoring what's been lost, the lost history that we need to know about, but also because I am somebody working for my community, what Shantavia was talking about, patents and invention, not just having an individual meaning, but having a collective meaning and a collective meaning that has political, social, and cultural um, relevance. And somebody had asked me in the chat, and you just asked me this question as well about, um, 
uh, what about women? Because I, I mentioned that women, of course, were also famously excluded from the right to vote and told they didn't have the mental capacity to vote. And uh, actually what got me started on this research in the first place was finding a pamphlet published by the New York State Women's Suffrage Association called Woman as Inventor. And I'm like, why are they spending their money publishing a history of women invention? Why is the NAACP spending its money uh, publishing a history of Black Americans in invention? For the same reason. These are people that have been excluded from the polity, excluded from legal and social equality, knocking on the door and saying, let us in. And these are our certifications of proof and ability and capacity to participate. Not sufficient to get the vote for women, not sufficient to overcome Jim Crow for Black Americans, but seen as a necessary step to fight back on these biologically based arguments that you don't have the capacity to be one of us in the center of full legal, social, political equality in the United States. And the stories we heard yesterday from Dr. Reed Smith and Dr. Ty Grandison just to me prove that. When they're walking through the world and people are looking at them and not seeing them as inventions, not inventors and not seeing what they're thinking about as inventive, which Shantavia is talking about what counts, what doesn't count. It's because of this long history of um, invisibility. So it's so important to fix that. Somebody was asking about the success after 2018, which is um, the patent office collected comments. Should we start collecting demographic inf information? And my answer is yes, definitely, but also carefully, because there are studies that show that due to implicit bias, patent applications with perceived female first names have worse outcomes in the US patent office. So if we tag them as being from a marginalized group on the way in, we risk um, depressing further patents granted to marginalized groups, but we definitely need the data. So, oh my gosh, so completely agree with Cara. Highly recommend uh, 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 Ms. Slubby's work. I don't know if it's Dr. or Miss, I see her in the chat. So please correct me if I'm wrong, if it's Dr. Slubby. She's written some of the most amazing books on African-American invention and innovation that I've ever read. Pat Slovey, look her up on amazon.com or wherever you get your books. I would like to add two points to Cara's remarks and then answer your question specifically, Dr. Bowden, about rethinking, incentivizing innovation. So specifically, you asked about women right, and you reference a specific date, 1913, and then also thinking about how women have navigated the United States Patent and Trademark Office as inventors. So the first known woman to receive a patent in the United States uh, got her patent in 1809. That was about 60 years before the first Black woman received a patent in 1868. Similarly, in 1913, when women marched for the right to vote in 1913, there was a group of African-American women from Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated who wanted to march and who insisted on marching even though white organizers did not want them to. Uh, when we think about uh, the chasm between the amount of venture capital funding that goes to white women founders versus women of color founders, I think one of the, the first things really as women and, and people who are allies of women is doing the intersectional work of realizing that the rising tide actually doesn't, right, doesn't raise all ships or whatever that phrase is, right? That there are intersectional differences that must be part of this conversation. One of the things that I get most frustrated by with data from any number of different sources is that I can find data about people of color or you know, quote minorities, which is a word I don't like to use, or I can find information about women, but finding intersectional data is very, very challenging. And there are differences, right? And so as, as Cara is talking about the experiences of, of intellectual, of patent applications with women's names as inventors. The other thing I highly encourage the USPTO to think about, and I've I've made this comment multiple times, so I hope somebody's here who's listening. The other data that I think is important is data around 
uh, the demographics of practicing patent lawyers. So my name is Shantavia. I have had some of the most biased experiences with examiners, probably because my name is Shantavia, right? As, as the lawyer, as the person prosecuting the patent application, not as the inventor who may have an ethnically ambiguous name. And so I wonder what the experience of other practicing patent lawyers are as they prosecute patents in the Patent and Trademark Office. Um, the other thing I would say, getting to uh, your bigger question around rethinking incentivizing intellectual property, I think it comes down to the way this conversation was framed and the way that the Wimelson Center defines innovation. Sometimes it's about customers, sometimes it's about community need, and the way that we've created our patent law revolves around who's the first to keep it secret to themselves until they can protect it. And when there's a community need, oftentimes the goal is not to be the first to privatize it, but the first to solve the problem, right? And the first to do things that benefit the community. So in what way can we reframe the conversation? I think one of the, the first places we can look is and a lot of the conversations happening at WIPO and the United Nations around traditional knowledge and how we protect or don't protect indigenous and traditional knowledge. Uh, I think also uh, as, as data is being collected about patent applications, there's a ton of research about the types of inventions black inventors try to get patents for versus everybody else. And oftentimes black entrepreneurs, black inventors are more concerned about these inventions that are good for the community or things that solve specific socioeconomic needs in the community and how we can better support those things. And then just the final thing, the third thing I would say about VC funding is as, as interesting as the concept of VC funding is, right? Finding the most innovative, innovative solutions to problems and providing financial resources to those. It is one of the most strict constructs in terms of what deals get done. Like oftentimes we're looking for scalable technology. You're looking for things that can be protected by patents. You're looking for things that have, you know, a, a hundred X return or a thousand X return or whatever. And what I believe the data will show is that black innovators, other people of color who are creating innovation are often pulled in a different direction just in terms of the types of businesses that we start and the types of problems we're looking to solve. And so rethinking you know, what scalable innovation looks like or what scalable entrepreneurship looks like is of critical importance and measuring not only you know, the things we've already talked about, but measuring the data around VC dollars and where those dollars go and whether there can be regulatory frameworks that incentivize restructuring the way money gets disseminated to innovators and entrepreneurs. Thank you so much for those comments. Um, I wanna turn now to a question that um, has come up through the uh, question and answer. And I think it really is pulling together uh, some of your comments that you've just um, kind of prompted us to think about. And so this question says, uh, the question is prompted first by Dr. Swanson's talk and then solidified by Dr. Johnson's, um, both excellent, thank you. Uh, I'm very, uh, the person is very convinced by Dr. Swanson's arguments about the dual role of patents, both um, their commercial and uh, political potential. Um, but this person is interested in, in inventive and innovative activities that fall outside the patent system, whether because they are legally unpatentable under the system at the time, because of industry custom or choice. How do laws and customs that structure what is patentable affect the commercial and political tools available to Black inventors? And then specifically to Dr. Swanson, in your research, have you come across particular moments when patent law narrowed or expanded the scope of what could be patent patent patented in revealing ways, then also kind of thinking about um, in the contemporary moment opportunities um, that um, Black inventors and entrepreneurs are engaging outside of the patent system that are that we should be discussing and thinking about. So any comments on that question? I, I have a comment about that, and I actually don't even think it's limited to Black innovators and Black inventors. 
But right now we're living in a time where a lot of technology is software based. A lot of technology is created by artificial intelligence. There's a lot of VR based technology and patent law just historically hasn't known what to do with that. And patent law has made it very difficult to privatize or to receive patent protection for certain types of technology, including software-based innovation. It's really difficult, not impossible, but pretty challenging. And interestingly, software-based technology has become one of our driving economic uh, engines in the US, right? And we figured that out. VCs have figured out how to provide a ton of money to software-based startups, even if they don't have patents. There's another question in the chat from Cedric DeHue. He asks about Arlen Hamilton and whether she's right in describing women and minority entrepreneurs as underestimated. And Arlen Hamilton, if you all don't know, is a black woman VC who's raised millions of dollars, who started out homeless, who um, does not have a college degree. I actually interviewed her on my podcast, The Shantavia Show, a few months ago. And I think she's exactly right to describe women and people of color entrepreneurs as underestimated. And she's figured out a way to fund these companies. She's figured out a way to provide funding to all kinds of startups who maybe don't have a corporation, but instead have an LLC, who maybe have not pursued patent protection for their software. She's invested in a company called Bandwagon, Bandwagon Fan Club Incorporated that is software based, that is blockchain based. And they have completely, <clears throat> completely uh, said, we are not going to pursue patent protection for our invention because we don't want anybody to know what it is. We think trade secret is better. We, we don't think a patent is right for us and is way too expensive. And so I think we figured out how to support the type of innovation that we want. And patent law has, in some instances, made it really difficult to protect certain technologies. I don't think that's something that's limited to Black inventors and Black um, innovators. I think it just requires creative thinking. So what Shantavia is pointing out, of course, is that protecting creativity through the law is not limited to the patent system. And people are putting this in the chat as well, right? There's trade secret law, there is copyright law. Um, and uh, in all of these areas, definitely the law puts a box around what is protectable. And that also puts a box around who the um, creator, the innovator, the originating mind is. And there's no question that all of our systems, our copyright system was started in 1790, just as our patent system was, um, were set up with a model of a white male creator as the source of this creativity that we're protecting by law. And that both women and non-white people have struggled in a legal system that is ostensibly race and gender neutral to um, sometimes fit themselves inside that box of an inventor or a creator in order to um, um, participate in the law. The, the answer to that, of course, is not always to, as Shantavi was talking about, increase the um, scope of protection. There are costs to putting more and more things into private boxes in terms of what we can collectively do with our creativity, right? Copyright is the life of the author plus 70 years. That's a really long protection and limits what other people can do with the work. Uh, patents also limit what other people can do um, uh, with the work. Um, I don't know, um, Crystal, if we're gonna get to the chance to talk about the question of restorative justice that some people raise, but I would, I would love to go there if I, can, if I can pivot us in that direction. That was where I was gonna uh, take us to next. So you can go ahead and get us going in that direction, yes. All right, so um, I had the good fortune on Tuesday this week to precede my attendance at this workshop with attending a workshop um, by the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project at my university, Northeastern University, which was having a full day seminar on restorative justice and reparations as restorative justice in the context of anti-Black lynching, anti-Black murders in the United States. And I attended that in part because of my interest in bringing this concept of restorative justice and possibly restoration into the intellectual property space 
which is where I'm working. So I have a student project um, that we're calling the NED project, which um, is named after that enslaved blacksmith whose plow was not patented by Oscar Stewart. And the purpose of that project, my students and I are working to find out everything we can about um, Ned and lift up his life and his creation, but think about that broadly in terms of what does restorative justice look like in this space, given the history that I talked about in um, my talk. And I was very, we're, my students and I are collecting ideas about what that would look like. One easy answer is a posthumous patent to Ned. And I say it's an easy answer because I don't think that would be that hard to convince the PTO to do. Um, uh, and symbolic, yes, but not necessarily um, restorative to the community which has been the subject of this extraction. So somebody in the chat, for example, said, should there be a fund for minority um, inventors to get help with those heavy patent costs that Shantavia talked about. Well, that's one possibility for a form of reparations to restore what has been taken in the past. And we can, uh, we're, my students and I are just really thinking, we're the beginning of thinking about this as creatively as we can, but I definitely think this is a space where restorative justice is called for and it's time to start thinking about what that would look like. Shantavia, did you have thoughts about kind of a restorative justice and especially thinking about uh, the ending of your presentation where you're asking us to think about how we want to join in the struggle? And so how would you prioritize what, um, how to join in that struggle? So, so specifically around reparations, thank you for bringing that up, Kara. One of the most contentious components of reparations is how to assign a cash value, how to assign a dollar value to hundreds of years of forced servitude. And I think one of the one of the easiest places to look is the patent system. We can find pretty clearly if there has been a patent for a thing that um, uh, to, to Kara's point about her presentation, where maybe technology has been stolen, or where we know that there's clear evidence that a person who was formerly enslaved, like Ned or like some other inventors, where there's pretty clear proof, and we know what those companies were able to do and what the dollar value of that technology gave to the owner of that patent or that business or whatever. It makes sense to me to start with a formulation where there's tangible representation of, of the theft of intellectual capital. And doing that, despite obviously the very difficult challenges around that, I feel like it makes all the sense in the world to leverage the, the, the record keeping of the patent system as a framework for thinking about at, identifying a dollar value for reparations. And in terms of, like to your point, picking a struggle, like what is the struggle you're going to pick? I, I think picking one is the hard part, right? Like saying, this is the thing, this is where my expertise is, this is my lane, these are the things that I'm passionate about. Obviously, you know, you eat an elephant one bite at a time. And I, I do believe that that reparations question, and I've been somewhat familiar with the work Cara's doing. I am a little bit late to the, the restorative justice concept as it relates to intellectual property, but I, I think that is a place that requires the best minds. ta Coates had a really interesting article around the case for reparations not that long ago. And he alludes to that even in the article. So I think if, if we're thinking about intellectual property as a place where we can pick a struggle and make some significant headway, I do believe there's a clear connection there. Thank you so much for, um, for your comments. And we are nearing the end of our time together, but I think that is an appropriate way to end our session by thinking about the connections between reparations, restorative justice, um, and how to transform um, these institutions um, so that more people can receive equitable treatment um, and, and, and prosper within them. I do want to thank our panelists, uh, Cara Swanson and Shantavia Johnson for their rich and insightful 
presentations. We didn't obviously have enough time to talk about all of the ideas that they presented about, but it really has given us um, so much to continue to think about and to learn about. I do want to thank everyone for attending uh, this session, attending today. I wanna thank the Limelson Foundation um, for sponsoring this program. And I want to encourage everyone to return tomorrow for session five, where we will address the question, how have black individuals and communities experienced technology. So thank you so much for your attendance and for your um, um, for your engagement. You take care.